All right. Hello, uh, my name is Lucas, and I'm going to start us out by introducing our paper. So the paper that we chose is titled Isolation and Characterization of Sigma-70 Retaining Transcription Elongation Complexes from E. coli. Uh, I also worked with Michael Morand and David Zach for this presentation. So let's go ahead and put us into full screen while I can start talking about what's happened here. So to introduce this, the study, we got to go over some review biochemistry um, and previous theory that existed at the time. I want to go ahead and clarify that this paper was published in 2000s, the early 2000s. So this sort of stuff learned in this, in this study used um, relatively basic techniques, but it's still a pretty instructive paper for the techniques that it employs. In order for a uh, core RNA polymerase to transcribe DNA into RNA, it requires a sigma subunit. Um, the sigma symbol is denoted here. And when the sigma subunit binds to the RNA polymerase, the hollow enzyme is formed. A previous theory called the sigma cycle uh, had been proposed. And what the sigma cycle suggested is that um, the sigma subunit and the NUS-A elongation factor would kind of exchange on and off the RNA polymerase during initiation and elongation to control transcription. So let me lead us through this nice graphic over here. Uh, it's best to start on the left side with just the core enzyme of the RNA polymerase. The sigma subunit binds to that, and now the RNA polymerase can attach itself to the DNA promoter and start transcription. However, but once initiation um, has started to occur, the RNA polymerase is on the, the promoter. In order for elongation to occur, the sigma cycle proposed that NUS-A, or NUS-A, however you'd like to pronounce it, binds to the RNA polymerase while the sigma subunit hops off of the RNA polymerase. And from that point forth, the DNA will be transcribed into RNA. And eventually, upon reaching a termination sequence, the RNA and the NUS-A elongation factor will dissociate, and we've reached the left side of the cycle. You know, we've, we've come full circle, going clockwise, and the core enzyme is back where it is. Um, this, it's a fairly logical kind of way to think about it, but as the results of this paper suggest, this may not be the case. Um, it might be a particularly unproductive system. So this paper decided to take a look at it. The goals of this paper are to determine if E. coli RNA polymerase retains its sigma subunit when transitioning from initiation to elongation. And apologize for the, for the spoiler ahead, but it turns out that some of the sig sigma subunits actually are retained by the RNA polymerase. And for the complex that's formed by the RNA polymerase and the sigma subunits, that stick along during elongation, those can be denoted as EC sigma 70. And another goal of this paper is to characterize how these particular sigma retaining E. coli RNA polymerases act based off of promoter DNA and termination sequences. Some of the components to look forward to uh, in this presentation will there will be a handful of gels. There will be um, some cross-linking reactions. There will be transcription assays, and there will be binding assays. So it's like a biochemist's dream that we're about to explore. So buckle in and let's get started. Uh, to provide a better visual description of the experiments and the questions that are being asked in the following figures, we decided to make a flowchart for each of the figures. In figure one, it's discussing the EC purification, the SEC, or the stalled elongation complex formation, and the SEC walking as well. And on top of all that, the quantification of the sigma-70 release. So essentially what figure one is looking at is how much of the RNA polymerase population is retaining its sigma-70 subunit during elongation. So right off the bat, it does some very important stuff. And then from there, it's asking, can we verify the presence of sigma-70 in elongation by using photo cross-linking? 
A photo cross-linking, this will not be the last time that you see this method in the presentation. It's very important for identifying um, the sigma 70 subunit and also um, the path that RNA polymerase takes when sigma 70 is still present during elongation. After figure two, we delve into isolation and characterization of the EC sigma 70, particularly how can we best isolate it and does the promoter identity on three different promoter sequences influence the amount of RNAP that retains its sigma 70 subunit during elongation. Going from figure three onto figure four, the authors decided to ask if sigma 70 alters the RNA trajectory in transcription. And we'll get to introduce some absolutely fascinating data with figure four. The last question that the authors wanted to ask is, is EC sigma 70, you know, our, our sigma 70 subunit retaining RNA polymerases, is it better in multi-round transcription than the sigma releasing RNA polymerases? And so now that we've given a broad overview of the author's questions, their goals in this paper, and the experimental flowchart, I feel like we are now good to talk about the materials and the methods, as well as the results for figures one and two, which Michael will talk about. All right, so the way we're gonna go about this, as you probably guessed from the last slide, is go figure by figure. Um, and what we're gonna do is first talk about the methods and then the results for each figure. And after that, we'll kind of tie things together, see which figures agreed with each other and what we learned about uh, sigma retention. So starting first with figure one, um, the first thing the authors did in this study is make a stalled elongation complex. And they needed this in order to do most of the analyses that will follow, uh, such as elongation and termination analysis, cross-linking, multi-round transcription, and all sorts of things. This was kind of like the first step that they needed uh, to make sure they could do in order to continue. And as we've talked about with regards to other papers, there are numerous possible advantages to using a stalled elongation complex, uh, one of which is that if you're studying transcription, all of your complexes will begin from the same point. So that's really important is that they have a common starting point, makes the comparisons um, more valid. Additionally, it allows us to do cool things like walk the transcript even one base at a time. And as you'll see here, they get to incorporate some special bases such as radioactive ones or ones that are able to do photo cross-linking. So this paper actually had a unique way of forming their stalled elongation complex. Um, and so what we can see here on this slide is their steps uh, that took them there. So we can see that first um, on the image on the right side, we have an RNAP which contains a sigma, which of course means it's active, is bound to the T7A1 promoter, which of course we know is just a strong bacterial promoter, um, that which comes from a phage. And so that's, that's all uh, pretty normal so far. And step two, the RNA begins to produce a transcript. Um, then this is kind of where the interesting part comes in. They actually anneal, a DNA oligo, so a short uh, piece of DNA, and they anneal that to the RNA transcript at its three prime end. And this, of course, isn't random. Uh, they controlled the sequences of the RNA and the DNA oligo just so that these base pairs would indeed match up uh, and be complementary. But as you can see uh, here on this right side, we have our RNA with a sigma. This is the RNA transcript. And now we've attached a B oligo uh, to the three prime end. And what that does is shown by step four. So next they add avidin beads and these avidin beads bind to the B oligo, okay? Um, and so what this does is that when you wash with TB, which is uh, just an abbreviation for transcription buffer, the only thing you're gonna be left with 
are those complexes that are bound to avidin beads, which in turn are only those that contain a B oligo, which then are those only that produced an RNA transcript long enough um, to, to become bound. Um, and so next, what they did is added RNA nuclease to cleave and release the uh, elongation complex into solution. And the reason they did this is because that's really all we're interested in going forward. We don't need the B oligo anymore or the avidin beads. So they collected the supernatant and uh, carried on from here. And so an advantage of this method that the authors point out, which uh, we want to bring attention to, is that it requires the RNA to be of a certain length in order for the RNAP to be purified. Uh, so this was kind of an interesting thing for them to point out. And um, again, something that they wanted future readers to know for their own studies. So now that we've talked a bit about the elongation complex formation, let's do a quick poll question. Um, and you can go ahead and hop on poll everywhere to do that. We want to know is when preparing these stalled elongation complexes, the authors specify that the template DNA was provided in 10x molar excess to the hollow enzyme. And what might be a reason this was done? Go ahead and, and give that an attempt. Okay, so hopefully you have um, put in an answer for that. And actually the reason for this, uh, it isn't so obvious, but uh, some of you may have come to this conclusion. It's that providing a huge excess of DNA template to RNAP serves as a way to ensure that only one RNAP binds to a single DNA molecule. Of course, it it's, can't be exact, but since it is such a huge molar excess, it's a very safe assumption that this was the case. Uh, and this really serves as a control for some of the later analyses to come. Okay, so next, what they wanted to do was another proof of concept. Um, and the, they're studying the elongation and termination of these elongation complexes that they've just made. And the reason that they decided to do this, uh, I think, is because at the time of publication, elongation complex formation was generally formed by immobilizing through protein or DNA uh, and not the RNA itself. And that's something that the authors state in the paper. So it seems that they wanted to show us that their special way of immobilizing through the RNA, uh, just going back up, see, they've immobilized through the RNA rather than through the protein itself or through the DNA. So that's a little bit, a little bit unusual for this time. Um, so they wanted to show us that this is indeed a valid approach um, of forming the elongation complexes. And as we often remind ourselves, Science communication is oftentimes about it kind of takes the pattern of here's what we did and here's why you should believe me. Uh, and we see these authors are doing that same thing. Um, so what we've shown here on the left is actually the coding strand of the DNA template. So of course the RNA is going to be identical except for the fact that T's will be used. And you notice that the first U in the RNA product is called for at position 33, which I've colored in red. And so what this actually means is that the RNA will be able to transcribe happily until it reaches 33. So we'll only be able to go through 32 um, as long as UTP is not provided. And so if you hop your eyes uh, over to the top right here, you can see that Indeed, uh, no UTP is available initially. They've provided ATP, GTP, and CTP, um, but no UTP. And um, they've also provided this CAUC RNA template, and this gives the RNA polymerase something to get started on. Um, and so what's gonna happen is they're gonna, the RNAP is gonna incorporate nucleotides very happily, uh, until it reaches this 33 position because no UTP is available. Also notice the CTPs are radio labeled. Um, so can anyone share which phosphate they've labeled, whether it's alpha, gamma, or what kind of phosphate? Yeah, so this is an alpha phosphate label. And so with that, does that mean that radioactivity will be incorporated 
internally or as an end label. Yeah, so alpha phosphate will produce internal labeling. And so that's what they're going to get here. And so if you're having trouble understanding this uh, stalling at position 32, you can think of it, uh, believe it or not, using the company HelloFresh. You know, HelloFresh is the company that delivers uh, prepared ingredients in the appropriate quantities and packages with the instructions to your door so you can cook without having the hassle of going to the store. And uh, for me, I always notice that HelloFresh offers 50 or $100 off your first week using it, which I think is the most obvious sign. Uh, the company's basically screaming to you how expensive they are if they're willing to give $100 off as a special promotion. But anyway, so they send you the ingredients. So think of it, think of HelloFresh. They send you ingredients to make a souffle. So they're giving you flour, butter, sugar, and you're following the instructions, throwing things in the bowl. Everything is going well. Um, and then you notice that HelloFresh didn't provide any egg. And step number six says, or let's actually say step number 33 says you need an egg. And so your process is gonna stop right there. I mean, you're not gonna wanna skip the egg, you know, it's, it's not gonna come out right. So actually you just stop right there. Um, and that's very analogous to what's actually happening with this RNAP. Um, so next, what they do, here you can see this exit aerial. They wash off all of these ATP, CTP, and GTP, and they provide UTP. So now um, the RNAP is able to incorporate a U, but it can't go any further because now we've washed away all the NTPs it used to have. So it'll actually walk one position. So going back to our analogy, imagine you call up HelloFresh and some guy or gal from the company comes to your door and says, you know, we're so sorry, here's the egg that you needed for your recipe. Um, and they take away all the other ingredients that you, you don't need anymore. Um, so you put in the egg and now you've moved up one step, but you notice that now it's calling for another sprinkle of sugar, uh, which the employee unfortunately just took away, tried to throw away being nice to you. Um, so again, you're stuck, but you've moved one position up the instructions. So again, that's just a way that you can think of this RNAP process. And finally, in step three, we provide everything they need, CTP, UTP, GTP, ATP, everything. Uh, and the RNAP is able to transcribe very happily until it reaches a termination or even runs off. So think of it, you're, you're making your souffle all the way up to the final step and you have a beautiful finished product. Or, Maybe if you run off, you actually forget to take it out of the oven. So you get a very different product, um, a, a block of charcoal, in fact, but um, you get a different distinct product. Okay, so next, uh, they wanted to quantify in what proportion the sigma subunit is released after transcription finishes. So now we're finally getting into the interesting uh, part of this study, in my opinion. Um, because previous theory holds, as the authors explain, that the release should be nearly 100% because, you know, um, as far as we know, sigma after the RNAP does its job is released and it has to rebind in order for the next round of transcription to occur. Uh, but we'll see if that's actually what they find really happens. So the way they do this is they take the reaction products, they run an SDS gel, um, and then they actually apply antibodies for each of these subunits. And this is a way to actually visualize things on the gel. It's a bit different than some other SDS gel visualization methods, but it's gonna work the same really, because you're still gonna see uh, you get those characteristic bands that we're used to. And this actually gives them a way to calculate the percent sigma present in each band. Um, and if there's a higher percent sigma in a given lane, uh, rather I said band before, I meant lane. If there's a higher percentage of sigma in a given lane, that means that some of the sigma was retained after uh, the RNAP finished its job. And you can see at the bottom, they're gonna vary a lot of different parameters here. And this is okay. You can actually vary a lot of parameters and still do good science, as long as you don't vary them at the same time. So these authors are gonna vary all these different things one at a time. 
which means that they're going to have a lot of different lanes in their gel, uh, which can make it a bit daunting, but that's really the way that you should do it if you want to draw uh, proper conclusions. Okay, so now let's look at the results here. Um, I've skipped panel A of figure one because it was just the schematic of the elongation complex and we've already seen that. So B is where we'll start. Um, you see I've highlighted two things here in red. So what conclusions can we draw from this gel? This gel is small, it's not daunting. So what are some things that we can deduce from this? Okay, so uh, now that we've taken some time to think about that, you see lane one is just the 32 stalled elongation complex. Uh, and then lane, that's lane one. And then lane two was where we walked it one step to position 33. And the conclusion we can draw from this is that uh, elongation complexes immobilized through the RNA, so rather than protein or DNA, can indeed be walked. Uh, so that's very useful to know in this study. Lane three, you can see we have some GR2, that's the termination products, and also some runoff products. So we have some finished souffles, souffles and some uh, bricks of charcoal. Um, but what this means is that the E. coli immobilized, sorry, the elongation complex is immobilized through the RNA can also um, respond to termination signals. So very simple proof of concept uh, we've seen. Okay, so <clears throat> next, uh, what we have here is um, figure one results. So this is panel C. And um, again, as I said, there's a lot of lanes here. So it can be a bit daunting, but we're just gonna take it step-by-step step and see what the important findings are. So I'll tell you up front, the big take-home message from this is that a substantial amount of sigma-70 was not released from the elongation complex. And this is in opposition to some of the previous prevailing theory. Um, so let's just take it step by step. You can see that um, if B oligo wasn't provided, we were actually not able to uh, recover any, any product, uh, which makes sense here. Lane three, you can see there's indeed no bands. And what this does, it actually rules out non-specific binding to the beads. So this is good. It means that their method worked well. Um, anything that we see in the gel was in fact from a immobilized complex that we wanted to carry forward with because it bound to the B oligo and therefore bind it to the avidin beads. So this is a useful control shown. Next, we can focus on lanes eight and nine. You can see that um, if what they wanted to show here is that sigma-70 retention was not due to interactions between sigma-70 and something else like DNA, RNA, or the core RNAP. Um, and the way that they showed that was by adding an excess of these things uh, to the reaction mixture before adding the B oligo. And so you can see if we compare lane eight which has these extra core and this extra DNA to its corresponding lane, which is lane two, the bands are the same. Meanwhile, lane nine, which has this extra core and DNA, if we compare that to its corresponding lane three, the bands are the same. And the fact that these bands appear the same, even in excess of this core and DNA, shows that sigma 70 retention wasn't due to sigma-70 binding to these other things. Um, indeed, sigma-70 bound to the RNAP holoenzyme, and that's the only way that it could, be, could have been retained. Next is lane 10. You can see they didn't provide any NTPs as expected, uh, no RNA products. So that's very simple control. Lane 11, um, here they use pure sigma-70 instead of holoenzyme. Um, and they applied that to the beads with oligo and process the sample just as in the same way. And they saw no bands. And what this tells us is that um, it wasn't sigma-70 just binding to the avidin beads or just binding to the oligo um, and then being released when we add RNAs. Again, the only way for sigma-70 to have been released apparently was by binding to the RNAP holoenzyme and retaining 
on the RNAP holoenzyme even after transcription finished. Okay, so again, complex gel, a lot of different controls, um, but just take the time and look at it one lane at a time and the conclusions should come through uh, just if you give it the appropriate amount of time that it needs. Again, looking at a gel, you never really understand it the first time, maybe even the second time, but um, all the information is there. So next, uh, panel D, this is where it gets really interesting. They computed the percentage of sigma-70 in the lanes uh, versus pure holoenzyme for the selected lanes. So what we can do is um, divide, really, the, use the darkness of the bands, image J, image quant, whatever you want to use, and um, use that relative darkness of the bands to figure out the percentage of sigma retained. Uh, and what they find is actually there's a big difference between which stage the um, which stage the elongation complex was taken from, and what they find is that there's a much greater proportion of sigma seventy retention for those elongation complexes taken from stationary phase versus the exponential phase of uh, bacterial growth. So why might this be? This is a big difference. It's a four x difference. So what, biologically speaking, could be a reason for this? Great, so hopefully you've had some time to think about that. And the authors themselves put forward a theory. They say that the increased E. coli sigma-70 um, retention during stationary phase could be because we want to keep those housekeeping genes, those essential genes that we need to transcribe at a minimum uh, for processes to continue as they should. We want to keep those transcribing, even with growing competition from other sigma factors um, and some other anti-sigma factors, different things that can throw off the RNAP and prevent it from doing its job of transcribing those essential housekeeping genes. So the authors say that during stationary phase, there's increased competition uh, for these sorts of resources that allow transcription to occur. And so the RNAP retains its sigma 70. Um, and this is an interesting, compelling theory, and we're going to explore it a lot more in the figures to come. Okay, so now we can dive into figure two. And here, what they want to do is verify in a new way uh, that sigma 70 is present um, during elongation. And so the way that they do this is they have some stalled elongation complexes, this time stalled at 20, and it's got 32p within the RNA, so it is radial labeled, and it's bound to DNA, again, containing our T7A1 promoter. And the RNA polymerase has a his tag on its beta prime subunit, uh, which again is one of the large subunits that make up its claw, as we've seen. And this um, his tag links the beta prime subunit with some nickel two plus beads. Okay, so from there, we incorporate some special analogs of UTP. So they're not UTP, uh, but they can behave in a similar way. These are called AZU and SU. And these uh, were located at position 21. And then as the complex was walked, also incorporated at various dispersed positions. But it was known. The authors controlled this and they knew where the photocross linking analogs were actually put into the transcript. So step three, UV light is used. So literally they had a tube, and a UV lamp above the tube. And that's how they initiated the cross-linking. And then step four, uh, they looked at an autoradiography gel and they knew for a band to show up in the gel, the protein uh, that made up the band needed to have cross-linked with RNA. Uh, and this, is, this would allow it to then by convention, be attached to the beta prime subunit, which was attached to the nickel two plus beads. So the only way you're going to show up is if somehow you are attached to that nickel two plus, which means you have to be attached to, in some way, the RNA polymerase or its RNA product. Um, and in this case, it means you have to be cross-linked with the RNA product. So that is sort of the key thing to keep in mind as you look at the gel. And then next, they added uh, CNBR, cy cyanogen bromide. And this hydrolyzes peptide bonds at the C terminus. Uh, 
of methionine residues. Uh, so it's a very specific, very useful process. And this allows them to sort of map where the methionine residues are. And if they see a place that has met residues, but no bands, they conclude that this is a site of cross-linking um, by process of elimination. So looking at this gel, here's another um, monster gel. You know, it's three different sort of panels that are somehow related. But uh, if, again, if you take your time, you can find the key findings. The left panel shows us that something non-beta prime was able to apparently cross-link. Uh, they've called it sigma 70 here, but they didn't necessarily know this right away. This band just shows us that if the RNA is at least 22 uh, nucleotides long, something that's not beta prime was able to cross-link. Okay. Um, and then on the right side, we see all sorts of RNA products. And what they did is they took these same products and ran them down here on a higher percent urea page gel. And what they note is that there's an absence of smaller, shorter uh, products. So they put in this CAUC here to show us if there was any small products remaining, it would be uh, around here in this area of the gel. But they see nothing. We just see clean RNA long products. And this is just a control that shows us that um, there was a high purity of these elongation complexes and cross-linking only could have occurred from those positions where we intended and where we were interested in. Okay, so next they map the RNA crosslinks uh, using that single hit cleavage at methionine residues. And we see um, they, they partially degraded the sigma 70, which again was that say mystery protein from the panel, the previous panel here. And they used STS page on a radiogram and it shows these met uh, methionine residues. And they used a beta as a reference uh, to show, compare the sizes of these, the positions of these different met residues. And they actually found a characteristic pattern of nested fragments belonging to sigma 70. So from this and using prior literature, they were able to verify that this mystery protein is sigma 70. So that's the main conclusion of figure two. Indeed, sigma-70 is retained during elongation, or at least it is present in this experiment during elongation. And it also shows that sigma-70 was, is likely to be close to the RNA binding channel in RNAP, because that's the only way that it could have uh, been near enough to the RNA product to cross-link and show up in the final gel. All right, so now we're going to be discussing figure three, which starts the isolation and the characterization of the EC20, which is representative of um, the subunits that will continue to bind to RNA polymerase during elongation. So specifically for figure three, the first method that was performed goes as follows. Uh, to give a little bit of background, some his tags were present, if you can follow my mouse, they were either present on the B prime subunit of the RNA polymerase or on the sigma subunit of the RNA polymerase during elongation. So by placing um, different TIS tags on the protein, the authors could effectively separate two different populations. For example, if you wanted to collect the entire population of the RNA polymerase, then all you need to do was use a HIST tag on the beta prime subunit because all RNA polymerases, regardless of whether or not they retain their sigma subunits, they will have a his tag on their beta prime. Um, on the other hand, if you put a his tag on only the sigma subunit and isolate the polymerase during elongation, then only the sigma subunit retaining RNA polymerases will be isolated during elongation. So this was a really astute way that the authors decided to um, exploit and um, in a method similar to figure one, how they could determine the amount of the RNA polymerases that would keep their sigma subunits. So continuing on with this method, first what the authors did was they generated EC20, which means that they provided three NTPs but excluded one so that the transcription complex would eventually get paused at a point along the DNA. <clears throat> 
um, they would generate it with a specific component, either a his tagged sigma subunit, a his tagged beta prime subunit, or neither. Let's keep in mind that they're not going to be doing two his tags. They're not going to do one on the beta prime and one on the sigma subunit. They're only going to be doing um, one at a time to isolate a population. Um, in some lanes of the gel we're getting ready to look at, they would um, include certain reaction components like DNA, the polymerase core, NUSA, the elongation factor, or KCL for 10 minutes. The idea of adding the radio, or excuse me, adding these reaction components was to see if those components would result in a different amount of sigma subunits being retained by the RNA polymerase. <clears throat> and the last thing that the authors did was they would load the EC20s onto the nickel beads and they would wash them four times with transcription buffer. Recall that when the pKa of, excuse me, when the pH is below the pKa for a um, histidine subunit, a histidine a residue, I should say, there will be a lone pair that will bind to a nickel subunit. So the his tag will bind to the nickel bead, whether it is on the beta prime or on the sigma subunit. And then you can wash all of the other components away with the transcription buffer, leaving behind the EC20 that you desire. And so the step three was basically getting rid of the junk that you're not interested in. And a part that can be confusing, but I'll try to explain it as best I can, is that 20 nucleotide transcripts were used as a way to quantify the amount of RNA polymerase, which were sigma or beta prime his tagged. The reason this is true is because the EC20s each held exactly one um, RNA. So you know that if you have a certain amount of RNA in the solution, then that is also representative of the amount of RNA polymerase that you have. And using the math through a program like ImageJ, or phosphor imager, you could determine the percent of RNA polymerases that would retain their sigma subunits. But I think that this will all make much more sense when we look on the next slide, which is discussing figure 3a's results. <clears throat> so there is a lot going on here, but one of the best things you can start with is looking at the different columns. So from left to right, there is the elongation complex by itself with no his tags at all. Then there is the elongation complex with no his tags at all, as well as um, nickel beads and a transcription buffer four times wash. And here we start to add the beta prime his tag, the beta prime his tag plus the nickel beads in the wash. And then we move on to the sigma 70 his tag subunit. Uh, I forgot to mention a very tiny detail is that the his tag is on the end terminal of the sigma subunit. And then this right here is where they begin to test different components like the elongation factor, DNA, the core subunit, and KCL to see if these influence anything. And so to clarify what's going on with this gel is the parts that were retained on the nickel beads are the parts that the gel is being run on. For example, the the separation technique in the last slide specifies that the elongation complexes were loaded onto nickel beads and then washed with the transcription buffer. What was performed on the gel was only what stuck onto the nickel beads. So it's expected that the stuff that is um, his tagged is going to be what's measured on the, the, the gel itself. For example, with the EC20 here, 100% of it was retained on the nickel beads that weren't even present at the time. So this serves as a bit of a positive control. You know there's gonna be some transcripts. However, when you measured the components that stayed on the nickel beads, when you had the elongation complex, the nickel beads and the wash, of course, none of it is gonna stick around because there are no his tags. So when the relative intensity was 2% compared to this positive control, it was reassuring to the authors that their method was working. So here is the control for the beta prime his tag. And when they did the beta prime his tag plus the nickel beads and the wash, 
they noticed that 89% of the RNA polymerases stuck around, which is good. Because as we discussed before, if you have a his tag on the beta prime subunit, then that means that you're going to be getting the whole entire population of the RNA polymerases, the ones that don't retain their sigma subunits and the ones that do retain their sigma subunits. So lanes three and four make sense and lanes one and two also make sense. The last bit is going all into the N-terminal his tagged sigma subunits. So to begin with, they did a control for the sigma 70 his tag. And then they started to measure what was retained on the nickel beads as we got from lanes six to 10. And one thing you might notice, the most important lane is lane 10, because this is where the, um, the sigma 70 subunit was his tagged, and then it was applied to nickel beads and washed. So the stuff that stuck around on the nickel beads generated an intensity of 31, which is essentially saying that 31% of the RNA polymerases that were retained were kept, that were retained were ones that kept their um, sigma subunits during elongation. And the number 30 might ring a little bit of a bell from figure one, where they used the avidin beads and confirmed that about 30% of RNA polymerases would keep the sigma subunits during elongation. I'm skipping all over here, going from lanes one to four, all the way to lanes 10. But you should know that lanes six through nine are testing other components of the reaction mixture to see if these components would influence the amount of sigma subunits that were retained. And as you can tell, it only goes up about 30 plus or minus 3%. So that means that components like KCL, the core enzyme, the elongation factor and DNA don't play a huge difference in the amount of um, RNA polymerases that are gonna retain their sigma subunits. So there we go. We've come up with a different way to quantify the amount of RNAPs that retain their sigma subunits during elongation um, by using um, a his tag and not quite chromatography, but a method that really reminds you of a type of chromatography that we've done in the past. So let's go ahead and succinctly conclude what we got from figure 3a. In corroboration with figure 1c, this method of isolation suggests that about 30% of E. coli RNAP will retain their sigma subunits during transcription elongation. And also the second result, as proved by the second half of the gel, shows that the addition of DNA, NUSA, CORE, and KCL did not appear to influence the amount of RNAP that retained its sigma subunit. <clears throat> so now we're going to be moving on to figure three. And we got to first discuss the methods that were involved with figure 3b. So using the really smart method that the authors used to um, isolate the elongation complexes using nickel beads ended up getting us some supply of EC, some, some elongation complexes that had been stalled. And this was analogous to the IMAC column in paper one that used um, T. aquaticus it's how they purified T. aquatus case in paper one, basically. Um, what the authors wanted to see this time was um, what would happen if we put these RNAPs on different promoters and compared their activities. The same um, DNA substrates that had these different promoters each had the same termination signal at the end. So the authors were essentially comparing um, different types of promoters and how they acted on the termination sequence as well on these promoters. From there, the RNAPs were walked to four separate positions by applying certain nucleotide triphosphates or just NTPs. And then in a different lane, one of the experiments that they did was that they provided excess NTPs and um, they did that in either the presence or the absence of NUS-A and they wanted to see how the RNA polymerases would respond to the termination sequences. So this was a very satisfying figure to see because it shows a really similar trend between each of these. Um, to give us a little bit of an orientation as to what's going on here, the GALP1, RRNBP1, and T7A1 are three different types of promoters. So the walking experiments are shown in lanes one through four, seven through 10, and 13 to 16. And as you can see, they're each stopping at discrete points 
without much runoff in the uh, above or below. So this is a really good sign that each of the elongation complexes that are retaining their sigma 70 subunits are behaving similarly regardless of the promoters. And another interesting part that I need to set us up for properly is that they did some chase experiments um, in the last two lanes of each gel. And the chase experiment is another way of saying that they just added excess NTPs and saw what happened with RNA polymerase. And they did this in the absence of an elongation factor or in the presence of the elongation factor. And it's a little bit difficult to see. Um, if you look really closely at these two bands right here, if there are more bands at the TR2 segment, that means that the, a majority of the promoter was, I mean, excuse me, a majority of the RNA polymerase was halted at the termination sequence. But if there's a thicker band at the runoff, then that means that the RNA polymerase didn't respond to the termination signal and just kept going instead. So yeah, you can go ahead and feel free to take a few minutes to look at this gel, but we're gonna ask a poll everywhere question on the next slide. So I'm gonna flip to that real quick, and then I'm gonna come back to figure three and discuss it after a few minutes. <clears throat> the question is asking, on the last slide, figure 3b examines the lanes corresponding to the chases with and without NUSA. What conclusions can be drawn about NUSA's impact on termination based off of figure 3b? So the question is asking about these lanes right here, and it's saying, what conclusions can we make about the, um, the responses to RNA polymerase based off of the promoter sequences? And it turns out that the answer is that the elongation factor makes the RNA polymerases respond more to the termination sequence on the GAL P1 promoter and the RRN EP1 promoter as evidenced by the decreased amount of the runoff band and the increased amount of the TR2 band when NUS A is added. However, we cannot certainly make this same conclusion for the T7A1, since there is no real band at the runoff section. And the TR2 is also not significantly different. So this is an interesting conclusion because the promoters appear to be the only difference between these three segments, yet the um, the response to the terminator is different for each of these. So this will be something worth considering. So now we gotta go ahead and wrap up figure 3B with the results. And it turns out that the EC sigma 70 can be walked for various distances from the start site. Therefore, the complex is not promoter specific. Since it behaved the same on those three promoters, um, it, those promoters don't actually influence the amount of sigma 70 that is retained during elongation. And also, since the complex is retained on the beads during transcription, since they were retained on the beads during transcription, we know that the NUS A does not displace the sigma 70 subunit from the RNA polymerase, as was postulated by the sigma 70 that I talked about, or the sigma cycle that I talked about earlier in the presentation. And lastly, it seems that NUS A caused the EC sigma 70 to become more sensitive to the termination sequence and run off less. This was the author's exact conclusion, though the reason I asked if this could be problematic is because this wasn't necessarily true for the T7A1 promoter, since there is really no change in activity at the termination sequence or any change in the almost minimal runoff bands that are there. So I believe that this finishes off figure 3B. Hello, my name is Dave Exact, and I'll be going over figure 4 and 5 for this paper. So as we learned in figure two, sigma 70 is likely to be close to the RNA binding channel in RNAP. And so the experimenters wanted to see if the retention of the sigma 70 subunit during elongation would alter RNA trajectory. Remember that the sigma unit normally dissociates during elongation. And so if it is there during elongation, um, this could change the mechanism and trajectory of the RNA itself. And so to examine this, the experimenters looked at 
um, different RNA templates and um, cross-linking to see where the RNA would travel. Um, so to do this, they made three templates containing a T7A1 promoter, which is a very strong promoter, and an eco R1 site located at varying, varying distances from the start. So at plus 54, 68, and 72. And next, what they did is they added a modified eco R1 um, endonuclease um, called the eco RQ111 roadblock. And what this would do is this will bind to these eco R1 sites and physically stop transcription as the um, RNAP runs into it like a roadblock. Um, and so what they did for this experiment is they made a stall elongation complex at position 20 um, using their um, sigma-70 retaining hollow enzyme or beta um, prime his tagged hollow enzyme. They also um, N-labeled the RNA with CTP so that they can look at it with audio autoradiography. And so once this uh, 20 stalled, this 20 mer was made in the EC20, um, they added a chase reaction mix containing a Zito UTP so that um, the complex would progress to the roadblock. So what a chase reaction is, is it's a bunch of NTPs, all the things that the elongation complex would need in order to transcribe. So they added a Zito UTP and Seg of UTP so that they could incorporate a cross-linking agent in the transcript at varying locations. Um, notice how there are different lengths of RNAP too, or of RNA also. And there are also different engine sites that are engineered at different locations. So there might be some, there's some here, some here, and some here. Um, and so what they can do is they can analyze different cross-linking based on the different lengths of the RNA that comes out with the cross-linking agent. And so that would be cool because they can also look at how the secondary structure of RNA as it might be longer, so it might fold, it might alter trajectory. And so that they can look at um, cross-linking interactions with that. Um, so once the stalling elongation complex was pushed to the roadblock and these azido groups were put in there. The complexes were irradiated um, with UV light to induce cross-linking. So if we look here, and this, this is just a schematic, this doesn't represent the experiment necessarily, but this little azido group right here, if it was right next to the sigma and it was irradiated with UV light, it might cross-link right there. Um, and then we see this one here, this will probably cross-linked to the beta prime unit as that's the active site. Um, so once they did all this, this whole um, cross-linking experiment, they wanted to separate the um, just the sigma-70 retaining elongation complexes and the rest of the population of just the norm, what's normally in, um, in the cell. So what they did to get the total population is they just took the solution that they had of all the different types of RNAPs um, and they just ran, ran on SDS page. But to separate the elongation complexes that retained sigma-70, they used nickel, a nickel column. So they use these hollow enzymes with the his tags so that um, the his tags, um, the six histidine residues would coordinate with the nickel, um, the nickel chelating agent. And so that would allow the elongation complex these uh, hollow enzymes to stick to the column, let everything else flow through. And then once that's all washed, um, they can actually elute the um, sigma 70 retaining units out of the column using aminazole because it will compete for the binding site, um, effectively pushing out the sigma 70 retaining complex. Um, and so then they can do an SDS page of that and just look at the um, retaining complexes. In SDS page. All right, so I'm going to give you guys a little bit to look over this um, gel and see what you come up with. Okay, so as we can see, we've got um, the total population and the um, sigma 70 retaining hollow enzymes with the his tags. Um, you've also got the different templates A, B, and C, which are the different lengths with A being the shortest and C being the longest. 
and then uh, which um, hollow enzyme they use. So importantly, I'm going to start off with this. You notice that there is cross-linking on the beta prime beta subunits in every single link. Now this makes sense because the azido groups um, will come in contact with the active site as they are incorporating on. And if they are radiated, then they will cross-link there. And the beta prime beta um, subunits are where the active site is. And so it makes sense that there would be cross-linking across the board in all the complexes, since the RNA will have a trajectory through the active site as it's being made, obviously. Then here, interesting enough, um, we see bands in the um, sigma-70 retaining complexes that are in line with the length of sigma-70. And so, as expected, the sigma-70 retaining subunits displayed a greater amount of sigma-70 cross-linking. And so this helps show that uh, sigma was retained in elongation. And the reason why we don't see any sigma in the solution is because sigma is uh, not associated with the complex. It's dissociated before elongation. So once initiation starts, the sigma comes off. Um, and so it will not interact with the RNA at all um, once it's being made. But we do see some cross-linking with the sigma unit um, during elongation, which is really cool. Helps show that um, we do actually have sigma-70 retaining RNAPs in um, the cell. However, you do see this little orange square right here, which is also the size of sigma-70. And so we can see that some of the sigma-70 is present in the total population. However, it's a very small band, and so it's a very small minority of the complexes that actually do retain the sigma-70. And interestingly enough, we have this really cool data right here of the alpha subunit. So as you can see in the solution, the total population, there isn't any interaction with the RNA trajectory, except for these little faint bits, which might actually just be the sigma-70 retaining units in the solution. But we don't see in a sigma-releasing um, elongation complex, we don't see um, alpha reactivity with, or reactivity with the alpha subunit. And so that shows that when the sigma 70 is retained during elongation that um, it alters RNA trajectory so that it comes in contact with the alpha subunit. And that's really cool. Um, and you can also see that since we have multiple bands here, um, we have multiple cross-linking sites in the um, alpha subunit. And that could be because there are different um, places that the RNA comes in contact or in um, proximity with the alpha subunit. Or it could be because we have multiple zeto groups on the RNA um, transcript that could interact with it. So that's really cool. There, that's really cool um, experimental data that we find that RNA trajectory is actually changed in sigma seventy retaining complexes. So the experimenters go on to explain some of the re reliability behind the results, and so they say that they can't. You can't judge these results based on quantity alone. And so the reason for that is that one, the solution and nickel fractions cannot be equilibrated by total radioactivity. And that's just because of the sheer different like concentrations of them. Um, you've also got the um, efficiency of cross-linking depends on multiple factors. There's the RNA secondary structure, which I mentioned earlier with the different lengths. Um, so longer complexes or longer transcripts might have more trouble coming in contact with the um, sigma 70 retaining subunit since it could be off or floating around or the azido groups could be hidden by um, RNA secondary structure. And they also say that there is no contaminating results of cross-contamination between the RNA and the solid support. And this is because the um, RNA or the whole solution was irradiated with UV before it was put on the beads. So that gets rid of that possibility. And so, yeah, further exploration here, we see that um, the increased accessibility of RNA to the alpha subunit 
um, in 70 retention or sigma 70 retention. So that's what we were talking about earlier with these red squares. That's really cool. Um, you also have the idea that um, different RNA trajectory or confirmation of the RNAP um, or in sigma 70 retaining. And so this different confirmation could be responsible for why um, 70 or sigma is retained during elongation. And so this difference here, this extra subunit during elongation could alter elongation or termination or just regulation of transcription in general. And they also go on to hypothesize that like there could be post-translational modifications of RNAP um, that cause uh, sigma to be retained. Um, yeah, and so like we saw earlier in figure 1D, um, the stationary phase is where these elongation complexes that retain sigma are most likely to be found. And so there could be some modification during that phase that doesn't happen during other phases of growth that's responsible for this trend. Okay, cool. Now we're on to figure five, which uh, the authors wanted to look at multi-round transcription. And so in order to get an idea of why the experimenters did this, here's a quote um, from them. So they say, we reasoned that complexes that retain sigma 70 in elongation would not require the sigma reassociation step after termination and might therefore have an increased ability to initiate multiple rounds of transcription in a situation when sigma binding is a rate limiting step. So this makes sense since if a complex loses sigma, it will have to reassociate with it in order to go through another round of transcription. And this requires energy, time, and those would cause, in theory, those sigma um, dissociating complexes to have a lower rate of transcription than a complex that just retains sigma the whole time since they won't have to reassociate it or anything. And so in order to test this, they made a stall elongation complex um, at position 20, which is shown here, with using their sigma 70 histag coloenzyme. They use different promoters, a strong, medium, and a weak one, in order to see if the rate limiting step of sigma association and binding to the promoters would affect multi round transcription. Um, they use identical transcribed reasons so that they could control for elongation rates based on the um, sequence or anything like that. Um, so once these elongation complexes were stalled at position 20, they either, they applied a fraction of it to the nickel beads so that they could isolate the sigma retaining complexes. And then they just left some in solution to get the total population. Um, of course, to wash the elongation complexes from the nickel beads, they use imidazole since imidazole would compete with the binding site on the nickel beads, allowing um, our elongation complexes to be eluded. They also did the same step um, and dilution also, as they mentioned in the methods, in order to control for any differences between the two groups based on purif purification processes. Um, and so once those, either the total population or the sigma retaining subunits were collected, they added a 10x multi-round mix. Um, so this multi-round mix contained everything that the complexes need for elongation including a primer. Um, they also included some radioactive CTP so that they could look at this using autoradiography. And they also added NUS-A, which is a transcription elongation termination factor just to allow um, for optimal transcription to occur. And every five minutes, they took a sample in aliqua and uh, put it on a gel the, so that they could look at the amount of transcription over time. Um, and so you might be wondering, what's the point of even making a stalled elongation complex to begin with if they're just going to go over multiple rounds of transcription? Now, the reason for that is they wanted to make a single round condition or single hit condition. So when um, this elongation complex is stalled here, it can just keep transcribing once the multi-round mix is made. However, it will come off of the trend or the um, 
template and have to reassociate. So in order to get a single round condition, um, the experimenters added rifampicin to stop the complex from reassociating with the template after it had already finished its first round. Um, RIF is a inhibitor of initiation, and thus, if you can't initiate again, then you can't go through another round of transcription. And so they did that to some of the sample, and then the other part of the sample was just allowed to go as many rounds of transcription as it wanted with this 10-time uh, multi-round mix. And they, um, therefore, then they um, looked at autoradiography and SCS paging in order to look at the different amounts of transcription. So I'm going to give you guys a second to look at this figure and this gel and come up with some conclusions about multi-round transcription. Okay, cool. So here we have the different promoters. Um, if it was a single hit or a multi-round condition of, for transcription, you've got the total population here and then the sigma retaining population. You've also got these graphs here to help visualize the um, the quantity or the round of transcriptions over time. Um, and so, very importantly, we see this huge increase in the amount of uh, product made by the sigma retaining subunit on the T7A1 promoter. And this difference between the total population and the um, sigma 70 is about five fold. It's sigma 70 retaining can do approximately five times more rounds of transcription than the total population in a multi-round condition, which is crazy. Um, and so that's fascinating to me. You've also got these um, single hit conditions, which all look the same. So that gives reliability to our um, results. You've got this second GAL P1 promoter multi-round and the Sigma 70 retaining had a two-fold increase in the amount of the rounds of transcription it can go through, which follows along with this side, just not as strong as it's not as strong as a promoter. And then finally for the RNBP1, you don't really see an increase, but it's a weak promoter. So then you've got these graphs here to help us visualize. And as we can see, especially in the T7A1 and a little bit more in the GAL P1, this um, sigma retaining subunit has a significant advantage in multi-round transcription over the normal or the um, total population of hollow enzyme at certain promoters. It is promoter specific. So here I have a question for you guys. This um, covers some of the material from earlier in the presentation, so it should be pretty comprehensive. So based on these results, what percentage of total transcription activity is sigma-70 retaining elongation complexes responsible for during exponential growth phase on the T7A1 promoter? And then we'll also try it We'll also explore the GAL P1 promoter during the stationary phase. So here's figure 1D and figure 5B. So the answer is 35% for the T7A1 promoter during exponential and about 66% on the GAL P1 promoter at the stationary phase. Now here's the reason for that. So as we see on the T7A1 promoter, we have a five-fold increase in the amount of transcriptional activity in the sigma-70 retaining subunit. And um, the sigma-70 retaining subunit is about 7% of the total population. So therefore, we have five, we have 7%, which is five times faster. So we would get a total of about 35% of the total transcriptional activity is based on the sigma retaining elongation during the exponential phase. Now this is much greater for the um, stationary phase, for the stationary growth phase, as this will be 33%. And so for the GAL P1, it's about twice as um, fast, or it has twice as many rounds of transcription 
um, and thus uh, two times 30, since we're talking about the stationary group phase, would be about 66% of the total transcriptional activity. Okay, so now we have the final panel of figure five, which goes over the enzyme kinetics of the system. So the first step is the sigma and RNAP association to form either the sigma retaining or the sigma releasing um, complex. And so if it's sigma releasing, you can have a backward step where the sigma dissociates, while with the sigma retaining, it can go backwards. Um, combine these complexes with DNA and you get closed promoter complex. And the next step is logically the open promoter complex and then transcription and then termination. So with the sigma releasing subunit, once the open promoter complex is made, the sigma dissociates. And so if you wanna go for another round of transcription, you have to reassociate the, comp the sigma and the RNAP together and then form a closed promoter complex again. Um, if you retain sigma, however, you could skip that dissociation and reassociation step. And so you have this whole step right here that is not included. And so promoters, which have a sigma association step um, that is rate limiting, will have a higher rate of initiation with a sigma retaining complex than a sigma releasing complex. This is due to like faster recycling as it the sigma retaining complex doesn't have to undergo this association step right here. Um, and so the strength of the promoters that I mentioned earlier as like T781 was the strongest, um, the strength of these promoters seem to be limited by the rate constant for sigma binding to the RNAP core. So it's not necessarily the RNAP binding, but the sigma of course um, has to bind to that sequence and it can be rate limiting. And so here's another question for you guys. Current estimates have defined the rate constant for sigma binding to the RNAP core at three times 10 to the sixth, one over molarity seconds. The association of the Hall enzyme with strong promoters is about two to the eighth times 10 to the eighth over molarity seconds. Um, based on this data, what can we assume about the kinetics of sigma 70 binding to the core in relation to the um, closed complex? formation. And so this right here, we're talking about this step versus this step. All right, yeah. So since the closed promoter complex formation is two orders of magnitude larger than the uh, sigma association, this sigma association is actually rate limited. So that gives us um, just an application of that based on this schematic. Okay, and now to, just to go over some more results, um, I'm gonna start with this one over here. Um, so the experimenters did an extra experiment, which they did not show, um, that if sigma 70 or sigma 32 were adding excess to the Stalgi elongation complex prior to the chase reaction, it will have no effect on the rate of multi-round transcription. And so that confirms that um, sigma 70, if retained, stays with the elongation complex for the entire transcription cycle, as the results would have been the same if there were extra sigma in there. And therefore, the rate limiting step of sigma binding to the promoter was not there. And since that rate limiting step wasn't there, the rates would not be altered. And so we also see that um, different promoters have different rate limiting steps with sigma association. Um, and so such promoters should selectively benefit from sigma retention in multi-round transcription as seen, especially with T7A1 and gal -P1. And so the Researchers go on to hypothesize that the significant increase in the proportion of sigma-70 in the stationary phase, as shown by figure 1D, um, occurs, occurs to secure the minimally required level of housekeeping genes 
transcription so that the housekeeping genes in stationary phase are taken care of with uh, not a lot of wasting energy in um, sigma association and just for more efficient transcription of the important life important genes. So now that we've gone through the figures one by one, we've gone through the methods and we've seen some results of individual figures, we're going to take a look actually at how these things link together. Um, and so we see here on this slide, we have five distinct major takeaways. And we were lucky here because the authors actually spelled these out very plainly. Uh, they literally numbered major conclusions one through five. And we won't always be this lucky when reading scientific papers. Sometimes you're gonna have, you're gonna have to read paragraph after paragraph in the discussion and conclusion section and sort of highlight for yourself what's important versus what sort of just, uh, you know, a jumbled discussion of different facts and statements. And I mean, to be honest, sometimes that's intentional. Sometimes perhaps the authors have made a statement that they want to make, but is a bit questionable. Uh, so sometimes they kind of add in some fluff uh, to the discussion. But um, anyway, in this case, we, we were pretty lucky in that they really spelled it out very plainly. Um, and again, we've, we've talked about this science communication is really a process of, you know, saying, here's why you should believe me. And the authors, um, or really any author, it's more likely for your audience to believe you if you can provide more than one piece of evidence. And we see that in this paper, for some of the conclusions, they're able to provide multiple panels uh, that show the same sort of message. So we've shown for example, that sigma 70 is retained by looking at, say, elongation, termination, multiple different things. And that makes readers more likely to believe this theory that you're putting forth. So let's look at these one by one. And it may seem silly that we're going to read these. I'm going to read these to you. But really, again, they are so important. They are indeed the major takeaways of the paper. Uh, so we're going to give them a good amount of attention here. So the first is that there's a biochemically and functionally distinct population of RNAP that retains sigma-70 throughout elongation. The key words here um, are biochemically and functionally distinct. So the authors are stating that these elongation complexes are biochemically different, of course, because they have sigma-70 bound even after elongation. And they're also the authors state functionally distinct. So the reason for this biochemical difference indeed serves a purpose when compared to other elongation complexes. Um, and they were able to show this through multiple different ways. Uh, figure 1b and 1c. Additionally, figure 2b and figure 3a. So you, know, you really should sit down with these figures and cross compare them and remind yourself how They've shown the same take home message with multiple different methods. Um, that's really a great exercise that we encourage you to do to really link these different things together in your mind and understand how this paper comes together. Next, they show that sigma 70 are retained complexes are present in greater proportion during the stationary phase of E. coli bacterial growth. Um, and they showed this in figure one uh, with, with two different panels, really coming together to make that part of the story. Um, and uh, we, we talked about why this might be. The authors are able to put forward a theory for that. And we'll talk about that, remind ourselves of that on the next slide. And so next we can see that um, E. coli elongation complexes with sigma 70 retained had an improved ability to support multiple rounds of transcription at certain promoters. And this comes from figure five, especially panel B. And this makes sense, really. Um, but the key fact is that it relates to a rate limiting step, uh, which is the binding of sigma 70. So previous studies have sort of tried to elucidate this. And you know, the, the picture is, has a lot of different caveats and complexities. But at the end of the day, we are, we're pretty certain that sigma 70 binding 
is a rate limiting step uh, for transcription um, in, in some capacities. And so if you're able to skip this step in some cases, that's gonna really improve your ability to just allow the RNAP to continue transcribing again and again, which is very important during stationary phase when there's high competition between genes, you can think of it uh, to be transcribed. Um, and so next, the fourth conclusion is that sigma-70 in the elongation of retention doesn't depend on the promoter sequence or the initial transcribed sequence. Um, so this one is, is interesting. Uh, they cite figure 3b and figure 5b here. But I mean, we're, we're free to think here critically um, about whether or not we really agree with this. Um, so, you know, for example, we can go back uh, to slide 19 here, which shows 3b. And you see these three gels, they used different promoters, um, which are boxed right here. And you can see, I mean, indeed the gels all have some in tier two, but you know, maybe, maybe not for T7A1, maybe there's not runoff here. Um, and also we can see different amounts of random products in lanes five and six for this first promoter and not so much for T7A1. So, I mean, you know, each promoter is a bit different and RNAP is gonna act a little bit differently with it. So, you know, the authors are, I think generally right that we saw the same conclusions here, but you know, you see some differences. Um, and we can look at 26 as well. You know, we do see, you know, some differences in the gels. So could this be too bold of a claim? Um, perhaps. But you know, that's that's something that was was stated here, and I think is generally true, but uh, we can dive into it a bit more. And fifth. They say that NUS A and sigma 70 do not exchange in the poly sigma 70 retained complexes. Um, and this is not needed in order for NUS A to perform its function. So, this really is a direct statement where they're saying what we thought was true with the old theory is actually not what we see happening. Um, and so, that, that's carried through here through the whole paper. So, now it's important, so we've seen the five findings, but how do we contextualize those in terms of what it means for biochemistry at the time of publication? And so here we've spelled it out, the post-translational modification of RNAP, which is predominant in the stationary phase, may be responsible for retention um, of the sigma-70 in elongation. So the authors put forward this statement and really what they're saying is they're theorizing maybe sigma-70 has retained RNAP complexes due to some post-translational modification of the actual polymerase. And maybe this, trans this modification happens mostly in the stationary phase. Uh, so this is, this is a, a possible explanation um, and something that could perhaps be studied further. Uh, so maybe we could actually do a confirmational study like we, we saw in paper two and find more about this. Meanwhile, um, they say that sigma-70 retention may eliminate a rate-limiting step in transcription, which is the reformation of the initiation competent holoenzyme. So as we talked about, this is a really about why sigma-70 retention matters. Who cares if the sigma-70 sticks around after elongation? And the reason is we care because it bypasses a rate-limiting step and allows more uh, genes to be encoded in the same amount of time or with the same amount of resources. And then they go on to talk about in vivo because of course this was an in vitro study. They say in vivo, the presence of activators, DNA superhelicity and other factors is expected to increase the rates of init individual initiation steps, making the potential impact of sigma retention on gene expression more pronounced. Um, and the English they, they used was a bit weird here. They say increase the rates of individual initiation steps. But what they really mean is um, that it would actually prolong uh, these, these steps required for RNA polymerase to do its job. So if we can bypass them, again, the acti activity is going to be more pronounced. So they think in vivo, this could be an even bigger deal. And again, they theorize that this sigma-70 retention 
especially during stationary phase, may be in order to ensure that those minimally needed housekeeping genes are transcribed at an appropriate level. And of course, this is not where the study should end. There's much more that should be done to build off of this. And one thing we wanted to bring attention to was a couple of, say, well, you guys can read these, um, these two sentences that are boxed here and think about how, how you feel about it when you read it as a scientific audience. Okay, so if you, you may have had the same thoughts that we did, which we thought this was kind of fishy. Um, you see what they say is that some may argue our in vitro conditions do not mimic the in vivo situation. So what they're saying is some people may criticize the validity of our results. But we highlight that the experiments that founded the longstanding model of absolute sigma release did not either. So, you know, for us, it kind of sounds like they're saying, you know, we didn't, indeed our results are, are not perfect, but hey, you know, the, the team who did the study before us wasn't perfect either. Um, that's kind of how it comes across. I think what they actually meant though was we're, we set out to either corroborate or disprove the old theory. So therefore, we've tried to mimic their conditions as close as possible so we can actually draw a parallel. I think that's what they really meant here, but it doesn't take away from the fact that the criticism is valid. We would like to see some more in vivo-like conditions if we're to believe that this is an important finding. Um, for example, they say, you know, since the in vivo levels of K plus and blue minus vary widely, our in vitro conditions reside well within the physiological range. Uh, so again, it's, it's not a perfect logic. You know, they're saying like the range is so huge that, you know, we were in the range, which is, you know, maybe true, but you know, where were you in the range? Were you actually near the normal homeostasis conditions or were you just kind of, you know, towards the, the one of the maxima of the range? Uh, we'd like to see those conditions ironed out a little bit better so we can uh, verify these results. And next, the authors state this themselves, it would be interesting uh, to assess the presence of initiation factors in an elongation complex formed by eukaryotic RNA polymerases. So this was, this study again was all about bacteria, but how about eukaryotic RNA polymerases? Are they retaining any initiation factors during elongation that allow them to bypass some rate limiting steps? Uh, definitely something that would be worth studying. 